Story One of Abaft the Funnel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. Story One Aristasius of the Wangoa. The old cat's tumbled down the ventilator, sir and he's swearing away under the furnace door at the stoke-hole said the second officer to the captain of the wangoa now what in thunder was aristasius doing at the mouth of the ventilator it's four feet from the ground and painted red at that any of the children been amusing themselves with him do you think i wouldn't have aristasius disturbed in his inside for all the gold in the treasury said the captain tell some one to bring him up and handle him delicately for he's not a quiet beast in three minutes a bucket appeared on deck it was covered with a wooden lid think he may make die this time said the chinese sailor who carried the coffin with a grin catchy him topside coals no open eye no spit no sclatchy me have got bucket ali same and make tight see he dived his bare arm under the lid, but withdrew it with a yell, dropping the bucket at the same time. Daya can't do. Masky drop down. Masky spill em coal. Have catchy me light there. Blood was trickling from his elbow. He moved aft, while the bucket, mysteriously worked by hidden force, trundled to and fro across the decks, swearing aloud. Emerged finally Aristasius, Tomcat and grandfather-in-chief of the Wangoa, a gaunt, brindled beast, lacking one ear, with every hair on his body armed and erect. He was patched with coal dust, very stiff and sore all over, and very anxious to take the world into his confidence as to his wrongs. For this reason he did not run when he was clear of the bucket, but sitting on his hunkers regarded the captain as who would say you hold a master certificate and call yourself a seaman and yet you allow this sort of thing on your boat guess i must apologize old man said the captain gravely those ventilators are a little too broad in the beam for a passenger of your build what made you walk down it not a rat eh you're too well fed to trouble of rats drink was it Aristasius turned his back on the captain. He was a tailless Japanese cat, and the abruptness of his termination gave him a specially brusque appearance. "'Shouldn't wonder if the old man hasn't been stealing something and was getting away from the galley. He's the biggest reprobate that ever shipped, and that's saying something. No, he isn't my property, exactly. I've got a notion that he owns the ship gathered that from the way he goes round after six bells to see the lights out the chief engineer says he built the engines anyway the old man sits in the engine room and sort of keeps an eye on the boilers he was on the ship before i joined her that's seven years ago when we were running up and down and around and about the china seas aristasius his back to the company was busied in cleaning his disarranged fur he licked and swore alternately. The ventilator incident had hurt his feelings sorely. "'He knows we are talking about him,' continued the captain. "'He's a responsible kind of critter. That's natural when you come to think that he has saved a quarter of a million of dollars. At present his wants are few. Guess he would like a netting over those ventilators first thing, but some day he'll begin to live up to his capital.' saved a quarter of a million dollars what securities did he invest them in said a man from fu chow here in this bottom he saved the wangoa with a full cargo of tea silk and opium and thirteen thousand dollars in bar silver yes that's about the extent of the old man's savings i commanded the old man was the rescuer and i was more grateful to him cause it was my darned folly that nearly brought us into the trouble I was new to these waters, new to the Chinaman and his fascinating little ways, being a New England man by raising. Aristasius was raised by the devil. That's who his sire was. Never ran across his dam. 
ran across a forsaken sea though in the wangoa a little to the northeast of this with eight hundred steerage passengers all chinamen for various and undenominated ports had the pleasure of sending eighteen of em into the water yes that's so isn't it old man Aristasius finished licking himself and mewed affirmatively yes we carried four white officers a westerner two vermont men and myself there were ten americans a couple of danes and a half-caste knocking round the ship and the crew were chinese but most of em good chinese only good chinese i ever met we had our steerage passengers tween decks most of em lay round and played dominoes or smoked opium we had bad weather at the start and the steerage were powerful sick i judged they would have no insides to them when the weather lifted so i didn't put any guards on em wanted all my men to work the ship engines rotten as congress and under sail half the time next time i carry chinese steerage trash i'll hire a gatling and mount it on the tween decks hatch we were fooling about between islands about a hundred and fifty thousand islands all wrapped up in fog when the fog laid the wind the engines broke down one of the passengers we carried no ladies that journey came to me one evening i calculate there's a conspiracy between decks he said those pigtails are talking together no good ever came of pigtails talking i'm from frisco i authoritate on these matters not on this ship i said i've no use for duplicate authority you'll be homesick after nine this time tomorrow he said and quit i guess he told the other passengers his notions Aristasius shared my cabin in general I didn't care to dispute with a cat that went heeled the way he did. That particular night, when I came down, he was not inclined for repose. When I shut the door, he scrabbled till I let him out. When he was out, he scrabbled to come back. When he was back, he jumped all round the shanty, yowling. I stroked him, and the sparks irritated his back as if it twas the smokestack of a river steamer i'll get you a wife old man i said next voyage it is no good for you to be alone with me whooper you be yow yow said erastius let me get out of this i looked him square between the eyes to fix the place where i'd come down with a boot heel he was getting monotonous and as i looked i saw the animal was just possessed with deadly fear human fear crawling shaking fear it crept out of the green of his eyes and crept over me in billowing waves each wave colder than the last unburden your mind Aristasius, i said what's going to happen we be said Aristasius, backing to the door and scratching i quit my cabin sweating big drops and somehow my hand shut on my six-shooter the grip of the handle soothes the man when he is afraid. I heard the whole ship tween decks rustling under me like all the woods of Maine when the wind's up. The lamp over the tween decks was out. The steerage watchman was lying on the ground, and the whole hive of celestials were on the tramp, soft-footed hounds. A lantern came down the alleyway. Behind it was the passenger that had spoken to me, and all the rest of the crowd except the half-caste are you homesick any now said my passenger the tween decks woke up with a yell at the light and someone fired up the hatchway then we began our share of the fun the ten passengers and i eleven six-shooters that cleared the first rush of the pigtails but we continued firing on principle working our way down the steps no one came down from the spar deck to assist though i heard considerable of a trampling the pigtails below were growling like cats. I heard the lookout man shout, Junk on the port bow! and the bell ring in the engine room for full speed ahead. Then we struck something, and there was a yell inside and outside the ship that would have lifted your hair out. When the outside yell stopped, our pigtails were on their faces. Run down a junk, said my passenger. Their junk! He loosed three shots into the steerage on the strength of it. I went up on deck when things were quiet below. 
Someone had run our Dahlgren signal gun forward and pointed it to the break of the forecastle. There was the balance of a war junk, three spars and a head or two on the water, and the first mate keeping his watch in regular style. "'What is your share?' he said. "'We've smashed up a junk that tried to foul us. Seems to have affected the feelings of your friends below. Guess they wanted to make connection.' "'It is made,' said I, "'on the glassy sea. "'Where's the watch?' "'In the forecastle. "'The half-caste is sitting on the signal-gun, "'smoking his cigar. "'The watch are speculating "'whether he'll stick the business end of it "'in the touch-hole or continue smoking. "'I gather that gun is not empty. "'Send him down below to wash the decks. "'Tell the quartermaster to go through their boxes "'while they are away. "'They may have implements.' The watch went below to clean things up. There were eighteen stiffens and fourteen with holes through their systems. Some died, some survived. I did not keep particular count. The balance I roped off, and it employed most of our spare rigging. When we touched port there was a picnic among the hangmen. Seems that Aristasius had been yowling down the cabins all night before he came to me and kept the passengers alive. The man that spoke to me said the old man's eyes were awful to look at. He was dying to tell his fear, but couldn't. When the passengers came forward with the light, the half-caste quit for topside and got the quartermaster to load the signal gun with hand-spikes and bring it forward in case the forecastle wished to assist in the row. That was the best half-caste I ever met. But the forecastle didn't assist. They were sick. So were the men below horror sick that was the way the old man saved the wangoa end of story 1